Witam Państwa bardzo serdecznie na kolejnym naszym spotkaniu z cyklu Muzeum w Mieście, Miasto w Muzeum. Uznaliśmy za słuszne, ażeby w ciągu, tych, w ciągu tego roku, który jest rokiem naszego jubileuszu 120-lecia, posłuchać w jaki sposób miasto opowiadają inni. Mieliśmy zatem gości, a ja wymienię, a bardzo poproszę ewentualnie, żeby pan Michał, jest pan Michał? Jest pan, że pan Michał mnie kontrolował, ponieważ z tego stworzyła się pewna księga opowieści, a dzisiaj ta księga ma swój ostatni rozdział triumfalny. Więc po pierwsze mieliśmy opowieść Jana Gerchowa z Frankfurtu. Potem mieliśmy opowieść, proszę, potem mieliśmy opowieść z Muzeum Miasta Gdyni, potem mieliśmy opowieść Liverpool, Potem mieliśmy opowieść Warszawa, potem mieliśmy opowieść Helsinki, Tina przyjęła, potem Żory, miasto na Śląsku, potem był Lipsk, potem było miasto Lipsk, Leipzig, potem był Gdańsk, a dzisiaj spotykamy się i bardzo się cieszę, że mogę Państwu przedstawić Joannę Monteiro, która jest dyrektorem Muzeum Miasta Lizbona. Witam bardzo serdecznie. Są przynajmniej trzy powody, dla których wizyta Joany jest dla nas niezwykle ważna i specjalna. No, pierwszy powód, że jest gościem naszego 120-lecia, za co bardzo dziękujemy. Drugi powód, że jest to finisz olimpijski, ponieważ jest to ostatni wykład w tym roku, który kończy ten cykl. Ale trzeci powód jest równie ważny, dlatego, bo Joana Monteiro jest przewodniczącą podkomitetu Międzynarodowej Rady Muzeum ICOM do spraw muzeów miejskich. Podkomitet ten nazywa się KAMOK. KAMOK to Organizacja, która zrzesza miejskie muzea na całym świecie i w czerwcu przyszłego roku, a więc no, praktycznie za 6 miesięcy, omalże równo, dlatego, bo od 3 do 6 czerwca, od 3 do 6 czerwca 2020 roku odbędzie się spotkanie, konferencja e, roczna e, Kamoku, która będzie miała miejsce w Krakowie i mamy nadzieję, że będziemy wtedy mieli okazję spotkać się całą rodziną muzeów miejskich i zastanowić się, jakie są nasze zobowiązania wobec miast, jak miasta dzisiaj opowiadać, dlaczego muzealnictwo miejskie jest dzisiaj jedną z najbardziej dynamicznie rozwijających się dziedzin muzealnictwa światowego. I wiele innych pytań, jak radzić sobie z problemem overturyzmu. Wróciłem dzisiaj z spotkania branży turystycznej, Wyniki, które w tej chwili mamy, to jest jeszcze nie koniec grudnia, mówią, że Kraków do początku grudnia odwiedziło 14 milionów turystów. Niedawno było to 13. Do końca tego sezonu być może, że dojdziemy do 15 milionów zwiedzających. W jaki sposób żyć w tym mieście? Jak Państwo pewnie wiecie, w lecie różnie to bywa. Zazwyczaj na pytanie jak daleko mam do Urzędu Miasta, jako dyrektor Muzeum Miejskiego, odpowiadam 5 minut drogi, chyba że jest to sierpień, wtedy 20 minut, bo się muszę przedrzeć. Żyjemy w mieście, które doświadcza tych zjawisk. Ciekawe, w jaki sposób te zjawiska dotykają Lizbonę, w jaki sposób dotykają inne miasta. Będziemy o tym rozmawiać w Czerwcu. Zapraszam Państwa na tę konferencję. Wykład, który w tej chwili rozpoczynamy, będzie prowadzony w języku angielskim. Jeżeli ktoś z Państwa jeszcze potrzebuje pobiec posłuchawki, ponieważ nie czuje się pewny swojego języka, to bardzo serdecznie prosimy lub jeżeli komuś słuchawki nie działają, to bardzo prosimy jeszcze w tym momencie się yy, udać. Yy. Perspektywy Miejskiego Muzeum. Dzisiaj koncepcja, program zmiany Muzeum w Lizbonie 
oddaję Żanie głos. We are very happy because we are with us. Not so cold in Poland? Not so cold in Poland? No. no. Sorry. Ok. Proszę Państwa, Żana Monteiro, serdecznie zapraszamy. So, um, Dzień dobry. <laughs> First, thank you uh, for the invitation to be here. It's an honor to be in Krakow, which is um, clearly uh, from what I've seen just this morning and afternoon, uh, what people say, which is one of the most beautiful cities in the world and in Europe, certainly. So I look forward to come back in June and maybe other times in holidays, not just working. Um, that was, I was telling the guide, the wonderful guide that um, made a tour with me in English in the center of the city this morning. After 10 minutes, minutes I was already saying, I have to come back, I have to come back. It is really so interesting. Um, so let me just um, thank again to Dr. Michal Niezawitowski, the great director of one of the greatest city museums in the world. Uh, one museum that we um, use a, as a good example many ways uh, in many uh, studies, comparative studies and lectures like this one. Um, and I'm also fortunate enough as a member of CAMOC, which uh, Dr. Niazabitowski already explained what it is, for those who didn't know yet. Um, now I'm very, very fortunate uh, since last elections we had uh, this year and since the conference in Kyoto, Japan, in September, to have um, Dr. Michal Niazabitowski uh, with us on the board. So we are uh, working more together, which is great uh, to learn from each other. As I am... Um, for now, Chair of CAMOC, I will start by uh, presenting a simple yeah, um, contextualization of this phenomena. Why are city museums so important? Not only for us who work at city museums, and of course for us they are important, it's our work, but for uh, more and more um, many people in the world. Um, because cities are more and more important. Um, according to the UN, to the United, United Nations, um, cities are already known as the major manifestation of cultural and economic and social acceleration phenomena. So it's the acceleration of every ways uh, of all ways of life that, that gathers and concentrates itself in the cities. Um, and um, if uh, uh, in 1950 um, there were two-thirds of the population living in rural areas and one-third in urban spaces, a hundred years after, so in 2050, it will be the opposite. Two-thirds of the world population uh, for the whole world, not just uh, Europe or North America, will be living in cities and the other third in rural areas, which has tremendous consequences and in all levels, economy, society, communities, everything. Um, so um, let me just show you in a very, I think, easy uh, graphic um, how is this happening in different parts of the world according to um, types of cities in, in uh, widening, widening uh, in, in uh, number of people living in the cities. It's this, usually it's measured by the number of people, of millions of people living and not so much in geographic areas. So you can see there how much fast, how so quick the cities are growing in the world, and not only the megalopolis of the South, South America and Africa and Asia, also mid-sized um, cities. They are popping up everywhere and growing and growing. And of course, museums tend to be a certain um, mirror of society in many ways, and try to orient and acknowledge 
uh, social phenomena and economic phenomena to um, help people to understand them a little better and um, live a little better with it or against it if, if we have to. And ab about this, um, I would like to, um, to share with you the, a very important topic, which, which will be the theme of our Kama conference here in Krakow in June, which is the right to the city. It was first uh, created by Henri Lefebvre, you probably have heard of him, and it has to do with the right to live in the city, the right for the urban spaces, also for minorities, also for marginalized groups. And then David Harvey, um, an English um, uh, expert, took this forward and um, Make, made a, a, another book about this, uh, developing this concept into uh, the right to change ourselves by changing the city. So there's a lot to know about this for those who are interesting. And um, in parallel with this, it's important for, for us, for everyone to know that even for economists and some politicians, the museums are seen as one of the most trustable institutions in the world. We are, we museums are connected with trust. Trust in the information source, because we are researchers and we are not exhibiting fake news, or at least trying not to. And also because we are already proven agents of economic growth especially when connected with cities, precisely. And also social transformation. And also um, a new type of measuring of the, importances, uh, the importance of the museums for the whole world is how museums contribute to well-being, not to happiness, that's a, a little a more blurred concept, but to well-being in many, in many aspects. But back to city museums, what is this? We are in Kamok studying what are city museums because the type of the museum is not written in a stone. And is, as it's uh, at the same time a very old type of museum, the city history museums, very old, but also a very new type the museum, of museums, the city museums in a new way, seen also um, of um, a type of museum also capable of taking um, not taking care, because we cannot do that, but to be aware of the cities in the present, or at least in a very recent past. So not just a traditional way of, of doing, of acting as a museum. So uh, Francesca Lanz, for, for example, in a very, very simple way, says that city museums are museums in cities, about cities, but also for cities. Of course, tourists matter, it's a very important um, public for all of us. Uh, Lisbon has a lot of tourism, but not as much as Krakow now. It's impressive, that number. And a little scary also. But um, city museums tend not to be the first museums the, the tourists go to. Uh, the national museums, at least uh, in, in my country and in other countries that I know, uh, tend to be uh, more, uh, and some privates, more visited by tourists. But of course, now we have like half, half, half foreigners, half Portuguese. But our main targets, uh, target is then, are the inhabitants, either Portuguese or foreigners living in Lisbon. What we see as the main targets is people who live in the city that we are um, researching and communicating about. Um, so um, one of our, of course, key challenges is how to interpret and explain uh, urban society in and within the constant process of change. So this is our uh, committee. Uh, this is one of the most young committees in ICOM, in the International Council of Museums, because the city museums process is also very recent. And there is another institution, international institution, which is the City History Museums and Research Network of Europe, which is an informal group. 
but it's also in, in, very interesting. I mean, both of them, and in, in we are more and more working together, connecting the two groups. In CAMOC, we have a, some very good publications, a review that it, it is online, free to download if you want to. It's very easy, and you don't even need to be a member to down, download it. We print one issue a year and make uh, the three other in digital um, format. So uh, we, we take care of um, the economic importance, spectacular growth, and possibilities of the present of um, cities and, of course, in the museum's context. So uh, the matters of interest for us is, like it's written there, almost endless, from pollution to migrations, from traditions to the myths that created the cities. Every city has a, a myth. Uh, regarding at least one. I, I, I know the dragon story already here, but there, I'm sure we'll have plenty of other stories related with the creation of Krakow and, the, and the, um, the, the evolution of it. And so we are interested in any kind of theme that has relevance to the people that live there for identity uh, reasons mainly. So it's about values. We had one special project that, that worked for over three years. It was only about migrations, um, migrants and cities, and refugees, and how cities that get millions or lots and lots of immigrants deal with it, and how the culture of that city changed because of that, and how the city is able to um, host them or not. So we had three workshops about this project in Athens, which has a huge problem about uh, for well, uh, considering the refugees and, and other types of immigrants also. Um, and then we were in Mexico City and then in Frankfurt. So very different realities about this. So over the last 20 years, roughly, we had an impressive amount of city museums growing on, all over the world. Not only new city museums uh, created from scratch, but also, and mostly, city museums uh, changing from traditional history museums about the history of a city. Um, I think, I don't think, I'm sure, that that's what is, is happening to this museum, Museum Krakowa, and it, was hap, hap, it is happening for, to many, many other museums, like the Museum of Lisbon. One, um, like Jean Postula, a Frenchman who wrote a book about city museums, and he is, it's a very good one, um, very good book, he says that uh, one, it is one of the best places, or it can be one of the best places, a city museum, to create a historic pr perspective of displaying the present, which is tricky, complex, difficult, but it's wonderful when we can do it, when, it, when, it, when it, we succeed, because nobody else can do it like we do when we succeed. These images are from Frankfurt, Luxembourg, and Copenhagen, but I could give you uh, dozens of other examples of old city museums that are being transformed. So the, the narratives told, the stories told in the exhibitions, the long-term and uh, the, the temporary ones are changing a lot with more humans, people inside the stories and not only abstractions or objects only, and more uh, attention to the recent past and even to the present times, and of course, more attention to inclusion and to diversity uh, underlying uh, of, uh, uh, an obvious democratic perspective. This is New York, uh, it's the, the new, uh, well, it has, four years or five years now, permanent um, exhibition um, about the story, the history of, of New York until a couple of years ago. And of course, you all know this one, Warsaw, the new uh, permanent ex exhibition downstairs with those wonderful models. So what would, could be this, uh, what could uh, city museums be or should be? History museums, yes, but also urban centers, or at least um, 
should, we should also include urbanism development, planning and identities and cultural values in our cities. And of course, we are any museum like any other, so we are not a center. We are museums, so we have to complete the museological functions. And we try to include history and also the present. And um, to be interdisciplinary, um, mixing many disciplines like anthropology and sociology, we cannot work without those, because otherwise we would never understand the population we have been having uh, over history and especially in the recent past. And they should not, I may say, uh, museums, city museums should not be a place anymore to freeze history. So it's about a specific period in history and that's it. And we call it city museum anyway. I don't think that we should go that way anymore. And it also should not be um, a way of calling city museum to have many monuments in the city for people to uh, see, a visit, a go in, but without any other explanations or without being proper museums. Or, of course, it's obvious, but it, it happens that people call name city museum for municipal museums that are not about the cities. So, now let's fly to Lisbon. Um, our museum was created in 1908, but on, only on the paper. Um, the first exhibitions um, opened in um, an old premises that are now uh, a library in the 40s. Then they changed places and finally opened in a, uh, an 18th century palace that belonged to a big uh, noble house and cottage of the middle 18th century, in 79, 1979, where the headquarters of our Museum of Lisbon is today. And um, uh, as you're going to see, uh, this m museum was a history museum and a decorative arts museum with a very good collection, mainly of um, documents, so engravings, plans, maps, tiles, and also archaeology. But after the 80s, uh, the museum kind of uh, freezed stayed the same for a long time. And um, the perspective in 2013 about how the museum should be is still what you can read on the um, mission statement uh, that was written by the um, former staff uh, there. So it, it states that it should stay as a historical museum, uh, very traditional, and that's it. And in 2015, sorry, um, a lot of things, lots of things changed it. And one of the things that we really had to change uh, was the name of the museum, because this museum was called Museum of the City, and that was it, without Lisbon in the name. So it could be the Museum of any city. Uh, nonsense, but well, we had to change it and we did. And um, this type of displaying stood like that for uh, a long time. So it was a very permanent exhibition. <laughs> it was permanent for too long, um, for many reasons, and it was a more like a, um, a house museum than a city museum, although it told already very well some parts of the history of Lisbon. One of the problems with the, the permanent exhibition that is still there, we, 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 didn't, we weren't yet able to change it totally, is that it finishes in 1908, which is by, um, well, it, it is um, coincidence that it is the year when, when the museum was created uh, formally, but um, 1908, because it's the most recent piece, this huge wonderful painting. It's the most recent piece in, in the, on, the, on the exhibition, on the, um, um, the exhibition uh, way in the end. So it depicts the first um, uh, universal voting process just before the Republican Revolution. So we want and we will have a new permanent exhibition with highlights of the history of Lisbon, but we'll, we will finish in the two th year 2001. 
So let me just um, tell you, for those who might not know, Lisbon is one of the oldest cities in Europe and in the world, and certainly one of the oldest capital cities. Um, Portugal was create, founded as a country, an independent country, in the 12th century, and Lisbon was already the capital, which is still the case until now. And um, the boundaries of uh, the country are still the same since the 13th century, with one exception only. We belonged to the Spanish Empire for 60 years in the 17th century. And then we had a revolution and it was solved, so no more Spanish in our country. <laughs> so we, we are still the same country, the, sm the same small country, which already had a, a huge empire in the discoveries times, but um, now we're just, um, uh, um, well, not very poor, but not rich country of the western point of Europe. So, in 2015, so almost five years ago, um, a couple of people, me included, after working in, in uh, re reprogramming, uh, conceptual re reprogramming of the museum, um, changed the name, the mission, the structure, uh, well, and we came out uh, with this uh, new logo type uh, with um, the names of the five branches. We will probably be seven in a couple of years, and for us it's already a lot, and uh, that's it. But I know th that for you this is probably very little, because you have 19 branches, and maybe 20 soon, I heard. <laughs> so, but anyway, for us this is already a huge museum. So we have a new mission, more... Um, concentrated more focus on creating uh, curiosity in people, interested in interesting people, um, interesting people, sorry, about the um, history, the identity, the values, about our people, about how we have been every, uh, in, in every century a mixture of different people coming from different places. Um, well, like any city, but anyway, this is about our, ours. And um, also in relation with our geography, it's very important to keep remem remembering that we have a, everything that happens has a relation with the space, the orthography, uh, in our case, a very, very, strong relation with the big river, the estuary of Tagus we have in front of us that links with the uh, Atlantic Ocean. And it was for ages, for, since ever, um, a very important port since Roman times until, well, now. So this is it. You have the, on the north, uh, the green spot is the headquarters of the museum, the, um, the palace, and downtown we have the um, Roman Theatre, the St. Anthony Museum, um, the West Tower, which is only for temporary exhibitions, and a small uh, archaeological site in a 16th century house. This is um, some of the pictures of, of the place, of the, of the structure. So here, the palace and the gardens. And here you, you see, you can see, well, it, it, I'm just... It's just for, for you to see how it was, it's done. This is the ground floor of the palace, it's totally restored. The building works are complete, but the showcases, the museography is not yet done. Uh, we have some problems with uh, administrative post process, legal things, financial things. I imagine that there's not only in Portugal, <laughs> it's around the world, but it's our big uh, issue, it's building works. It's our big issue, right? Because uh, controlling the times, it's, it's, it gets really complicated. But anyway, we expect to be uh, reopening the, the whole um, new uh, long-term exhibition in two years' time with the renovated um, palace. So here, so here is a, a small um, museum about St. Anthony, but it's not anymore a dark room of sacred art. 
It has sacred art, but it's not dark anymore. It's bigger. And it also has a uh, very important for our culture part about the popular and um, not only religious, but also almost pagan festivities linked with Sant Antony, um, uh, especially in June, where the whole town is uh, a festival the whole month. It has uh, to do with music, with dance, with um, marriages, uh, well, you name it. The Roman theater museum and the ruins had also some uh, remodeling works and it reopened in the end of 2015. And uh, we have a, um, every July uh, classical theater being performed in the ruins. It has a third of the original Roman theater that was built in the first century of, well, the first century of our era, in the time of the Emperor Augustus. And then we have the West Tower, which is a big building in the famous uh, central square of Lisbon and the country facing the river. It's for me uh, the most, uh, one of the most beautiful spots in the world I have seen up to now. And this building hopefully uh, will finally uh, be closed for complete restoring because it, it is a historical building, as you can imagine, with a very um, high value um, in heritage, uh, as a public heritage. And um, it, will be, it will reopen, restored, not transformed in any way, just restored, but adapting the inside only as a temporary and event uh, museum site for the Museum of Lisbon. We could never have long-term exhibitions here because this is just facing the river immediately, so humidity, salts, and all that. But for temporary exhibitions, it's very good. And this is a, a small um, archaeological site where we can see a piece of the Roman wall and also another piece of one of the medieval walls that Lisbon had in a very um, interesting house uh, built in the 16th century, which is called the Diamond House, the Diamond Point House, because it has diamond points made in, in marble in the facade. So uh, as I was telling you, um, the building works is our major topic of uh, challenge. Uh, and we still have so to, to finish the modernizing of the long-term exhibition, uh, which will have, of course, very different stories told in, def in really different displaying forms with um, layers of knowledge in drawers and, and also in multimedia devices. And um, we will also have other buildings one is already uh, on the way, uh, an industrial um, heritage building. It was an old mill as part of a large, very large, huge complex of militaries in, in, in the city. So it will be a, a way to tell something about the uh, industrial heritage. And of course, the, the everyday challenge, which is to keep on updating contents, keep on updating programs, keep on doing better in every way. Uh, mm -mm, this is just to show you if I can. Yeah, good. Um, a draft of a rebranding that we are doing just now of um, our image um, to have more um, printed graphics with the new image, because I, I, I don't know if you have here this problem, but it's a very common issue when the museums are multi-sited, when we, one museum has mul a multiplicity of buildings, for people to understand that they are all part of one museum. So we are working with uh, different designers now. The sound is almost... Oh, thank you. <laughs> and uh, showing the five sites. It will be released in the beginning of next year, a, a whole campaign about what is this strange thing called Museum of Lisbon. <laughs> we are very excited because we love it. <laughs> This 
These are, of course, objects from our collections, St. Anthony, the tiles from the 16th century. This is our biggest model of Lisbon, one of the historical paintings. The Roman theater, one of the many maps, ceramics, more tiles. Oh, sorry, this means five places to discover, to know, to observe, to understand, and to experiment. Five places in the city that gives the name to the museum. And this, this photo is an artistic photo by an artist that was displayed in one of our first temporary exhibitions in 2015 that I will just right away, whoops, in a couple of minutes show you. So our collections, so I already told you that we have uh, many engravings, many engravings done by um, German engravers and Dutch or Flemish and also some French ones but also Portuguese, of course, about uh, Lisbon, the city. D did you know um, that we had a huge earthquake in the 18th century? No. Oh, you did. Okay. Many, some, some of you, yes, and some no, because I, 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 <laughs> I see the nodding. <laughs> okay, so for, for those who don't know, um, in 1755, there was a huge earthquake in the, whole, in, the, in the whole Atlantic coast. Yes, you know that, okay. And Lisbon was the, the most um, damaged city. And um, it was thrown down, the downtown, and not only downtown, up to north and up to south. Thrown down by a tsunami, the earthquake, and fires after that. And this was very important because Lisbon at that time was a very rich city and very well powerful city. And uh, the news went very quickly, um, not on the internet, because it didn't, it didn't exist, but very quickly reached the north and center of Europe. And it was um, su such um, a ca catastrophic um, event that Voltaire wrote about it, and Kant and Goethe wrote, it also, uh, wrote about this, this event. And it was the first natural catastrophe that um, the natural catastrophe that was seen by some of these illuminists um, as a, a natural thing and not a punishment from, the God, from God, which was uh, usually uh, how people interpreted things like that. So, um, and it also it was the, f the, the beginning of the concept of civic protection civil protection. So the firemen organizations and the um, nursery or nurses organizations started to be uh, structured from that event on, not only in Lisbon, but in many other cities in Europe. So um, our king, um, oh, sorry, let me, if this is quickly, yeah, more or less. Um, our king, Joseph I, had a very powerful and intelligent uh, minister who was also a tyrant, uh, but very clever. That, that man, this guy, Marquis de Pombal. He was a visionary and he commissioned uh, plans for um, architects and engineers in Portugal, but also, uh, well, he got drawings from London and Germany and you, you name it. Um, for, to do what? To plan the city, not to be reconstructed, but to take, take the advantage of what happened and create a modern city, which what was what, what was done. And the two, the, um, the two people who won the, the, the bid, kind of a bid, um, were two military engineers, Portug the two of them Portuguese, and they designed a grid an urban grid, orthogonal urban grid, so in parallel lines and with larger uh, streets uh, compared to the medieval and uh, Arab structure that was kept during Renaissance times and Baroque times too. And so this is why 
not only because, or not so much because of aesthetic reasons, but more because of pragmatical issues, because like that, it was easier to get the, um, the city cleaner and also to get more, um, to be more pra pragmatical for the um, commerce and the admi administrative activities, so for financing and commerce. So um, this plan of the new Lisbon was inspired very much, not to say it was copied because that's too much, Edinburgh, Boston, um, Torino, and other cities uh, in the States, in the United States and Europe. Well, some of the paintings, some of the models, some of the wonderful tiles we have. Also, uh, in this last four years, we have been investing very much in making our storages better. And we have already our central storage, the main one, which is a very, very big building, um, in very good conditions now. Uh, we were investing ourselves bits by bits, and then we got able to have a international program only uh, specific about uh, museum storages, which is um, designed by ICROM. Um, so it is the International Organization for Conservation. And we had 20 experts in, in conservation and restoration coming from many countries and learning on site with three uh, teachers, monitors, mentors, uh, as they call themselves. And after that, uh, our storages were really very good. And we created a, um, an area, a very big room, but just one, that room, uh, we are still working on that, but, um, by the way, it's not finished yet, uh, in, in this storage to be um, visitable, to, to, to have public by um, appointment, of course, but we can just show um, a presentation, a generic presentation of what our collections are about. And people love storages because it's a hidden thing. It's a, you know, <laughs> always. Okay, so what are we trying to do? The same as everybody, seeking relevance, trying to be more relevant trying to matter more, trying to attract more people to be interested in our city because of our museum. Reveal more our own collections and other collections that are, can be researched by us. Promoting knowledge by doing that and engagement. So we want to, the museum to be more a reference of what the city is now and was in the past and for people to recognize the uniqueness, what we have that is in only in our place, not to be the others don't have what we have is not that, is what is Lisbon? What are we? We are different from every other place. We know all, we all know that, like Krakow, Krakow is different from every other place. But when the places have a very strong identity, which is the case here and in our city also, we should, the museum should do more about that in our case that the museum before did. So we are trying and working hard. Some of the temporary exhibitions we started in 2015 or on purpose with two big temporary exhibitions, big because they st stayed both for a long time. We try to invest in good temporary exhibitions, but then they stay for six months or eight months. Um, or even longer, uh, at was, at, as it was the case of the Light of Lisbon, because people asked to, to postpone it, and we, we did it. So the first one was about the, the wives of fishermen that had a specific role in the city, selling fish. It has to do with sociology things and anthropology things. The Light of Lisbon, why? Because the natural light of Lisbon, for those of you who have not yet been to Lisbon, is a special light, it's a lovely light. And we wanted to, it's, it's the number one value for residents and for foreigners. And we wanted to study this. We cannot exhibit light, it's impossible and stupid, but we wanted to study with scientists, with physicians. If it's different to our eyes, why, why is it? And we, we got to understand it and to explain it why. There, there, there are reasons, physical reasons. And we also worked with art, 
uh, in the uh, 20th century and contemporary, mainly cinema, photography, and also other uh, visual arts. We also had a um, uh, shorter exhibition about earthquakes and working with the um, Civil Protection Department of the Council. This is uh, our first um, uh, international exhibition comparing a specific time in history of Lisbon and Edinburgh, precisely because of those uh, exchanges of plans for the new towns in, in both places. Very interesting stories. A huge um, exhibition about um, the best of our tiles collection. The majority of those were never, have never before been seen by uh, Lisbonians. So we will try to keep doing this, but it's not easy because they are very huge panels, very heavy. So we, but we will, we will do it more and more because they are really uh, wonderful. And a specific uh, type of tiles uh, made in Portugal and specifically in Lisbon, in the Lisbon big region. Uh, there, you, you will not find any uh, similar tiles uh, elsewhere. The Dutch ones are very different. So um, an, an exhibition about projects for, for Lisbon, mainly in the, in the 19th century and 20th century, that were commended, were done, were finished, but were not built. And how would the city have been if they have been built? And of course, uh, as here for every exhibition, we have a program of talks and lectures. This is one, another one about the history of, of our city from the pavement's point of view, from Romans up to the macadamia, uh, up to uh, roads. So, um, uh, um, yeah, motor roads, pavements. Um, so it was um, interesting to see how the floor was was changing according to the paradigm of uh, public life and private life. Slavery is also a topic that we are um, trying to deal with because it's we we need to do that since uh, three years ago, and we will keep keep doing this integrating some of the slavery testimonies in our permanent collection. Now we have a um, temporary exhibition that is called Plural Lisbon that has a chapter about uh, slavery as well. This is um, about a photo, photo book of two, two architects about Lisbon in the 50s, futures of Lisbon. Yes, we dared to have a, an exhibition about reflections on the future, on the far future, not next year. Um, not um, political planning for the city. Um, we had a pool of experts from architecture to sociology and geography and even philosophy and ethics to think with us in the exhibition and in a book, a thick book we made because of this, and lots of uh, talks, crowded talks, um, about what are the main problems we have now and how should they be dissolved and how, how come future solutions could help to, um, well, to diversify our city and handle different challenges to come in different areas from psychology to economy. Um, a very different exhibition this year we had about the West Tower place and the two other towers that were there. It's quite it's almost a mythical place for many of us. And this is the plural Lisbon about uh, living together um, in harmony or not at all in harmony with Muslims and Jews and Christians since the Middle Ages and also with um, foreigners communities living in Lisbon, Italians, French, Spanish. It's one of the first, we will have more, well, it's, sorry, the first one of more exhibitions and projects we will have on diversity, trying to, to, to tell the, some of the various sides of the stories because there's no one side or even two sides. It, it, there is always more. We have many uh, publications. These um, six books were only... Um, uh, released in during this year, 2019. Um, it's not uh, usual to 
to make so many books, but um, this year was like this. We also have some um, partnerships with um, contemporary artists, which we like very much, from um, um, urban um, street art, but, well, they, it's, a, it's um, a two artist group. They um, act in, in walls, but it's not exactly graffitis. It's, well, um, high quality art and other projects related to um, many things, like the, uh, the myth of the saint who is, um, the Saint Vincent, who is um, linked to the origins of the, the city and the country itself. So we de deconstructed the myth in, through uh, contemporary art. And so just one example of the exhibitions we, we also sometimes, not very uh, often, but sometimes do outside our uh, museum in other places, in Lisbon and elsewhere. Uh, of course, we have, like everybody, regular partnerships with universities and NGOs and artists. We get um, conferences every month from um, uh, two universities by historians or sociologists. And for us, it's also very important to keep on um, better and better promote the well-being in our museum sites, as long as it's not just shallow festivities. It has to do with uh, our heritage and with our collections and with the themes that we research and that we know better than others. But using that, we can promote well-being for many types of people. So, of course, I'd other, other than the talks and the conferences, we also have some courses. Um, this is a course about tiles. We already had three times and keep having people. Learning pro programs uh, for all types of people um, always about uh, the history of Lisbon or the or issues or themes of the present times in Lisbon. Uh, the, our learning uh, department also constructs material, learning material. They make some very creative um, toys and games. We have lots of tours in the city. Um, this is, uh, people love it and we love to do it. Um, linking the, 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 the different museum sites from one to another or in different parts of the city uh, about specific topics. We also work um, as a long-term um, project with um, people with special needs, with mental special needs, and we work with a theater group and we, we have one uh, person in our staff that is um, specialized in this type of, of work, but also a, he, she is also an historian. So she writes the plot of this place. They already had two t types of plays um, about two specific periods or events in the history of, uh, of the country, of the national history that took place in Lisbon. Some of them are already um, manifesting some uh, better ways of um, speaking or explaining themselves because of this practice of, of theatre. We have a, a new programme specific for young mothers and, well, young mothers meaning women that just have birth, gave birth, and, and their babies with a... Um, physiotherapist for babies, and then um, also they have a relaxing moment, uh, learning about history in, of Lisbon moments, connecting with some of our collection artifacts. And it's uh, very successful for small groups. Cl classical theater in the ruins. We ha has, have um, a nearly um, event about a reading and storytelling for families. And a special Baroque carnival in our palace. It is a huge success also with uh, groups of um, professional musicians and dance, Baroque dance, or well, some 
well, Baroque dance is very difficult, but anyway, medieval to Baroque dance a teacher that, uh, that teaches people to um, be able to dance one or two dances during that event, that night, and people came in costumes and we didn't even ask it. So it's quite amazing. Very funny also. And we have a different event uh, in the carnival also, but it's the Lupercalia, the Roman, um, the origins are in Roman for what later became the carnival. <laughs> so uh, also with some costumes and um, uh, um, a meal inspired in Roman um, food, as, as far as we can tell. The Romans are crazy. It's another uh, yearly event taking place in September with, um, well, all kinds of, of events and also lectures and, and, um, and, and courses and, and conferences. Regular concerts every month uh, in the Roman theater, the, the hour of Bacchus, so with uh, music and wine, of course, and guided tours as well to the exhibitions, and in the St. Anthony Museum, which is more related to the um, uh, Portuguese traditions and, and Lisbon tra traditions, Fado music also every month, um, after a, um, a tour to the collections that are on that museum site. Um, related with St. Anthony festivities, we tried and succeeded as far as, uh, as it happens um, to re um, make the tradition of creating um, thrones that, like this um, wooden structure. W w the museum gives to people the wooden structure for the thrones to be done in during the month of June. Um, people put every whatever they want, Saint Anthony or not at all, and um, they put them on the streets on the windows or on the balconies or whatever. It's quite funny. And also, we, have, we are slowly, very slowly, but trying, because very slowly, because it's just uh, one anthropologist in the museum and we try to act with, in partnership with um, universities, but to make it as a very long-term project, as it has to be, it's not easy. But step by step, baby steps, we are trying to get to know some of the most important or relevant immigrant communities in Lisbon. Um, here you ha can see a man from um, Mr. Farouk from Bangladesh. His restaurant is the, um, um, the real consulate uh, where the Bangladesh immigrants uh, reunite and gather and, uh, well, have. Uh, Wherever conversations, and not only the consulate, not, not just the consulate. And Teresa from Cape Verde, um, she's one of the um, main figures in the project that I will, I will just let you know about um, the urban gardens in Lisbon. It will be our next exhibition. Ourselves, of course, we have to also think of sustainability and act. Uh, and, and um, correct some wrong things done in the past and um, give some, uh, take some steps into being ourselves more sustainable and also um, simple, very simple gestures like to take the oranges of our oranges trees in, in the, the museum garden and give them to some associations that take care of um, to reduce waste, you know, uh, probably you have here also, to reduce the food waste they, they distributed to, to the ones that need it. So, uh, Lisbon Urban Gardens, this, we, we are working very uh, hard on this during this year and last year also. This is, uh, will be an exhibition to be open in the, uh, on the 7th of May. Uh, you are invited already to come. I will send you an invitation. Um, and this is about urban gardens in Lisbon since the Middle Ages up to now. And why urban gardens? This is a crazy idea. Because it is about sustainability of the city, green spaces, but not only that. Also, It has also to do with natural resources, with absorbing water. 
and, and with getting water again to the air. Uh, so it has to do with climate change, but it also has to do with uh, embracing diversity of people because those, the people who works in, um, on the plots of the urban gardens are um, native uh, Lisbon Lisboans, but also immigrants from Iran to uh, Ukraine to Paris. Uh, many types of immigrants. So it is a way of finding diversity in, in, in the city. And of course, it's also, about, it's also about well-being, about eating well and about linking again with nature. So um, we will have, it's not just an exhibition, it's an exhibition, it will be the book, uh, of course, and we will have many types of activities inside the museum and outside the museum. It's also about urban planning and how people transformed the green spaces as they uh, needed to have more uh, cultiv cultivated land. Uh, so it's a, a bit of a struggle over time between rural identity and urban identity. And we will um, explain how the actual um, green, uh, uh, green vegetable, um, not green, sorry, vegetable gardens in Lisbon that belong to the council management works and what's not working so well. We will explain also um, uh, the types of, guard, uh, of um, urban gardens that are better for sustainability, both the balcony uh, urban gardens and um, uh, the backyards, and also the smart gardens, which you only have to to put uh, electricity on, and that's it. So this is we are working uh, with biologists, experts in permaculture, and other types of um, of um, biological agriculture. We are working with engineers, with uh, historians, and architects, and of course with anthropologists. So um, I will just show you a brief, sorry, it's, uh, 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 where are you? No, nope. ah. a brief video about what we will see is um, a short um, pieces of three interviews that we uh, made to, um, people who are working in urban gardens and explain to you why are they doing that and what for and what ideas do they have. Uh, it will be uh, one Iranian, one French and a Portuguese one. Uh, I asked one of my friends to grow the seeds from Iran. We put them inside of the garden and then okay. after they grew up a little, we transplanted them here. And they have a very good rate of production, so we will give them to our friends almost every day. Okay, it is uh, allium or tare in Farsi. We cut it and put it in the store, among other vegetables. And also we can use it fresh as a, a, a company. For the three gardens you, are, you will see it are in the center of place, Lisbon. But so they are small, it's not a rural area, not at all. Is, uh, a French immigrant living in this place. Here we will see the gardens here. For me, it's a proposition, and it's a proposition of the agriculture that I do in the city. In my vision, my dream was to find the conditions, to have the possibility to develop what was a production at a higher scale, that could permit to integrate other functionalities in terms of education and also in terms of ambiance. Because a cidade, por exemplo, produz muito lixo orgânico, uh, muitas vezes não é aproveitado, e a fazer a produção de hortícola na cidade podia se aproveitar, por exemplo, essa matéria orgânica. Uh, há também muitas águas uh, 
que antigamente eram aproveitadas, águas do subsolo. Enquanto essa água, se calhar, por não ser tratada, não é bom para o consumo, podia ser aproveitada para alimentar hortas, por exemplo. Acho que integrar espaços de produção agrícola na cidade pode ter imensos benefícios, imensas funcionalidades. É só uma maneira de imaginar qual é o modelo. This park uh, is between museums, the National Museum of Theatre and the National Museum of um, Costume. Sorry for this. Finally, we're... No. Oh, you don't... You are not seeing what I do. Can someone help, please? Hmm. Okay, so um, uh, the exhibition will have a, um, a part, half of it, or even a little more than a half, will be ab about the history over time of the urban gardens and the planning of the city about and around uh, urban gardens. And um, then it will be about contemporary times, so um, the users, the people, and the... Um, the voyages, the trips of the seeds, because people go to their countries of origin in Africa and India, in, well, Asia, wherever, and even in better places in Europe, and bring the seeds of the, the plants they love the most, and then they plant it in, in these uh, gardens. And, the, and then it's also about movement of people and plants, and of course, food. Um, in the, well, in the end of this, uh, the whole thing. So, um, let me just thank you. It was lovely to be here. <laughs> Bye.
Bardzo, bardzo dziękujemy. Może to jest prawda, że my mamy w naszym muzeum więcej oddziałów niż muzeum w Lizbonie, ale już to widzę, że pani dyrektor pokazuje, że z kolei w muzeum w Lizbonie mają cztery razy więcej pomysłów niż my. Czujemy się wzmożeni do pracy. Proszę Państwa, czy... Ach, jeszcze co chciałem powiedzieć, że ona skierowała do nas zaproszenie. No, państwo wiecie, o co mówię, nie jest bezpiecznie nas zapraszać. Czy ktoś z Państwa ma pytania? Bardzo proszę. Po polsku bardzo proszę, bo tłumacz nie będzie słyszał. Gdyby ktoś z Państwa chciał po angielsku, tłumacz nie będzie słyszał. Do mikrofonu. Wiem, że Lizbona to miasto wielu muzeów. Chciałem zapytać, czy Państwo współpracujecie z innymi muzeami i na czym ta współpraca polega. I drugie pytanie, jeśli można. Jak wygląda, wygląda finansowanie muzeum? Thank you for your questions. So, uh, yes, we work with other museums uh, in Lisbon. Um, we don't have a, a, a fixed protocol with other museums, like we have with universities, but we work very often with other municipal museums, like the Museum of Fado, the Museum of Fernando Pessoa, which is a Famous, the most famous poet we have in Portugal, and um, a monument, uh, two monuments, the Castle of St. George and the, um, and the Monument of the Discoveries. And we also work very regularly with the National um, Ancient Art Museum for lending uh, things, and we work also for researching with the National Child's Museum. And uh, we have worked also with the Ethnology Museum. So it depends a lot on the projects, but of course we, we, we work together. It, it's nonsense otherwise. otherwise. So about financing, we only have the uh, financing from um, the council money, but not directly. So af um, until t two years, three years ago, we depended on the... Um, uh, council directly, so we depended on the cultural m municipal department, and uh, so we got a, a year subsidy, a year budget, and um, sometimes we will we need to get part uh, sponsors elsewhere, and sometimes we succeed, sometimes not. And since three years ago, since then, we, um, like the rest of the museums and monuments and theatres that belong, that are property of the Council of Lisbon, we are now managed by a public company that is 100% public, um, only devoted to the culture of Lisbon. So it, it manages the whole museums, monuments, theatres, a cinema, um, the, the whole festivities of Lisbon also, and uh, the literature house, uh, and I think that's it, yeah, that's it. And in the, muni in the municipal old uh, same uh, structure, uh, they, they manage the archives and libraries and other things. Um, so about sponsorships, we get Sometimes the most useful are not in money, but in objects, in things, like lending um, electronic devices for some exhibitions without paying anything, um, or paying directly for the um, insurance for some objects to get to our museum from foreign countries, things like this. So it depending, depends a lot, uh, but it's not easy for us uh, to get sponsorships because we don't have yet the culture, uh, the economic culture, uh, the habit of uh, companies to sponsor um, culture. Um, and the companies which easily sponsors comp uh, culture already uh, 
have some national museums that take everything that it is possible for them to, to give, like some banks and insurances, insurance companies. But we try to get um, small sponsorships in money sometimes for special exhibitions, and sometimes we get it. Any other questions yet? Bardzo proszę, bardzo proszę. Tak, do mikrofonu, żeby pani w kabinie mogła usłyszeć, co pani pyta. Ja się bardzo cieszę, że Muzeum Miejskie w Lizbonie podjęło temat ogrodów, parków ogrodów, bo jest to element miasta. Miasto to przecież architektura w zieleni, tak powinno być. I muszę tutaj się podzielić taką żartobliwą może uwagą, że ja przywiozłam nasiona żakarandy do Krakowa i wysiałam w domu, urosły na wysokość 20 centymetrów. W warunkach polskich te drzewa nie mają racji bytu, ale można zrobić podobno bonsai z żakarandy, drzewa przepięknie kwitnącego niebiesko-fioletowo w Lizbonie i w innych miastach Portugalii. Tak więc cieszę się, że zieleń jest przedmiotem zainteresowań Muzeum w Lizbonie. I moje pytanie, czy polska emigracja, Polacy są widoczni w działaniach Muzeum Miejskiego w Lizbonie? Czy w ogóle są identyfikowalni, bo jest ich sporo. Um, thank you. You must come to see this exhibition. <laughs> um, so, uh, first, the jacarandas. It's my favorite tree <laughs> uh, because of the color. It's a, an amazing, lovely, uh, co violet color and the, the violet and the blue in the sky, it's just uh, magic. But it only lasts for two months, between May and the end of June, and that's it. You have to wait another year <laughs> to see them blooming. Um, but it's too cold here for them to survive, I'm, I'm afraid, I think. But anyway, um, about Polish people living there. No, we don't, ha we, we don't have uh, anything about Polish people because they are not at all as many as um, people from Ukraine, Romania, uh, Brazil, and um, some African countries that have a lot more people, at least in Lisbon. I don't know if the Polish, Polish people are more in Lisbon or more in the rural areas or in the north um, cities, maybe in the north cities, in the Porto. Well, I don't know, but I will check and I will let you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you come to Lisbon in May or June and we'll see the, the jacarandas and the urban gardens uh, exhibition. Bardzo proszę. Czy ktoś jeszcze chce o coś zapytać? Mówiłem, yy, mówiłem o tym, że nie jest bezpiecznie nas zapraszać, ponieważ raz do roku jako Muzeum Krakowa yy, wyjeżdżamy na yy, taki tour do jakiegoś miasta w Europie, gdzie eksplorujemy muzea, gdzie poznajemy środowisko muzealne yy, i robimy dużo bałaganu yy, swoją obecnością. Po tych wykładach, które w tym roku mieliśmy, no mamy co najmniej kilka miejsc do odwiedzenia, ale tanie linie lotnicze Ryan być może, że wskazują nam Lizbonę, kto może wiedzieć. Proszę Państwa, jestem bardzo wdzięczny Żanie za przybycie do nas. Tym bardziej, że to jest początek naszej przyjaźni. Tam widziałem taki slajd o wystawie, opowieść o Lizbonie, opowieść o Edinburgh. 
być może, że opowieść o Krakowie też mogłaby kiedyś znaleźć się w Lizbonie, a opowieść o Lizbonie w Krakowie. Kreatywność tego, co opowiadała Joana, przekroczyła moje wyobrażenia, bo myślałem o różnych rzeczach, które może zaoferować muzeum, ale żeby współpracując z muzeum można było poczuć się kapustą, no to już przekroczyło moją wyobraźnię. Joana, przyjechałaś do nas w czasie magicznym. Przygotowujcie się tam. Tam się przygotowujcie, co proszę. Przy, przyjechałaś do nas w czasie magicznym, dlatego, bo pierwszy tydzień grudnia to miejsce, kiedy spotykamy się wokół krakowskiej szopki. Jutro będziesz mogła zobaczyć nasz konkurs pod pomnikiem Adama Mickiewicza. Nasze krakowskie szopki są w przestrzeni miejskiej, to pewnie nie to samo, co tron świętego Antoniego, ale to jest taka obecność tradycji w mieście, która jest bardzo dla nas ważna. Nie chcielibyśmy, żebyś wyjechała tylko ze wspomnieniami. Chcemy dać ci taką miniaturę Szopki Krakowskiej, pod którą być może w tym mieście nie jeden raz się spotkamy.